John chapter 1. Verses 1 and 2. An exhilarating and sobering and powerful two verses to read and to meditate on because they are God's word written about his word incarnate. Let's read together John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. In 1894, a woman named Mabel Loomis Todd wrote a book titled The Total Eclipse of the Sun, in which she described, quite poetically, the unique experience of a total eclipse where the moon passes completely in front of the sun and for a few moments conceals its full glory from sight. Following is a part of her description. As the dark body of the moon gradually steals its silent way across the brilliant sun, little effect is at first noticed. The light hardly diminishes, apparently, and birds and animals detect no change. As the entire duration of an eclipse, partial phases and all embraces two or three hours, often for an hour after first contact, insects still chirp in the grass, birds sing, and animals quietly continue their grazing. But a sense of uneasiness seems gradually to steal over all life. Cows and horses feed intermittently, bird songs diminish, grasshoppers fall quiet, and a suggestion of chill crosses the air. Darker and darker grows the landscape. Then, with frightful velocity, the actual shadow of the moon is often seen approaching, a tangible darkness advancing almost like a wall, swift as imagination, silent as doom. In reading that description, I found myself shuddering at the thought of a similar eclipse that happens in my heart. I know it happens in every Christian's heart. It has happened in every human's heart from the time they are born. The eclipse of the glory of Jesus Christ, the incarnate God. It's an eclipse I think we could label, in some cases, familiarity. We are familiar with Christmas carols that talk about the shocking truth that God the Son took on flesh and came to earth. There's a familiarity with the majesty, with the brilliance of who he is, of the glory of even these first two verses in the Gospel of John. If you're like me, uh, you can sing Christmas carols without a flutter of heart, without a, a warming of soul. It can feel almost as though a silent chill gradually steals over the landscape of your heart, and the full glory and brilliance of the Son of God begins to be eclipsed by familiarity with the topic. My prayer, and I believe the purpose of John in writing this book, is to pull back that eclipse, that familiar eclipse that covers over the glory of Jesus Christ, the Word of God, God the Son, come in the flesh and expose the light of His glory to us. What a Christian needs more than anything is the sight of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. That is what you need more than anything. 
That is what you need. It's, it's more than a favor at work. It's more than unity in your family, though it relates to how you can relate both to your work and to your family. More than you need a, a particular help in overcoming a, a, a single issue of sin. What you need is the sight of the glory of Jesus Christ, God the Son incarnate to save us. That's what I need. That's what you need. And the familiarity that creeps over our souls is imperceptible at first, and then with a shocking velocity, it steals its way and conceals the glory of God, the Son. The Word of God has the power to push that eclipse backwards and to unveil to our eyes His glory again. And I pray that this passage this morning, and as we continue to walk through this series, that is the effect. That's been our prayer, our hope as pastors as we anticipated this series called Advent, the glory of Jesus Christ, that the hope is that the eclipse of familiarity would be pulled back and that we would be affected, undone, overtaken by the glory of Jesus and who he is. This morning, we're going to focus in a particular way on the deity of Christ, that this is the God-man, God the Son, who became incarnate to save us. Next week, we're going to focus on the other side of of who he is, his identity, that he is truly man. So truly God and truly man are the focus of the next two weeks. I, I pray God will move in these weeks to illuminate his glory. Let's let's look at these verses in which John introduces his friend and Lord, Jesus Christ, using a title, The Word. John makes it very clear as the book unfolds that this word is a a carefully chosen title for Jesus. He uses the word as a way of saying that Jesus has this particular responsibility in the Godhead, in the Trinity, to reveal God. Author D.R. Carson uh, calls Jesus the self-expression of God. He is his own person in the Trinity, but he he reveals, he, he, he expresses who God is in a particular way. That's why John calls him the word. Jesus is, as it were, the triune God speaking in a way that human beings can hear, revealing something that human beings can see and understand. He is the self-expression of God. Now, I want to look first at these two amazing sentences, and then we're going to walk through in the next few verses to talk about how his deity is revealed in this passage. All right, let's just notice. John starts with a very familiar phrase, in the beginning was the word. For anyone knowledgeable of the Old Testament scriptures, that should immediately hearken back to the beginning of the Bible. The Bible begins, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It is an absolute conviction of any biblical follower of God. There there was only one being present before all things, and that was God. Deity was the only being that existed prior to everything else. So when he says, in the beginning was the word, it introduces a a shocking, almost a, a startling possibility. That there was something or someone else there at the beginning is a shocking statement for a faithful Jewish man to make. Because every faithful Jewish person would know the Shema, the Lord our God is one. There is no other God but God the Lord. He is the one and only, the one God And so when John says in the beginning was the word, and then, lest we misunderstand and think of the word only as an inanimate speech, he says the word was with God, and here's the ultimate shocker, the word was God. John is introducing a shocking revelation. The singular God existed in a multiplicity of persons, And one of those persons is called the Word. The Word. He was with God. He was distinguishable in that sense from God in one sense. But at the same time, he was equal to God. He was God. So John sort of borders our understanding of what this means by saying, on the one hand, he is distinguishable as an individual, and yet he is not any less than God himself. Just 12 words, 12 words in the Greek, John introduces a mystery beyond our wildest imaginations, 
It's more glorious than our, our, our greatest longings, the greatest desires of our hearts. And the goal of those 12 words is not just mental information. It's an unveiling of glory. It's pulling back an eclipse and letting us see. The word was with God, which is to say that he was distinguishable. Yet before we even have a chance to misunderstand, John is saying that there are two eternal beings or some wrong belief like that. John concludes and says that this word was God. As Edmund Clowney writes, the word does not by himself make up the entire Godhead. Nevertheless, the divinity that belongs to the rest of the Godhead belongs also to him. The word was with God, God's eternal fellow. The word was God, God's own self. Now, now brothers and sisters, we, we have to tread carefully right here. We are on holy ground, and it is holy ground that we are quickly familiar with because we've heard about the Trinity and, and the glory of Jesus Christ becoming flesh, but we, we need to tread carefully and let our hearts feel the peeling back of the eclipse and let ourselves see the glory of what John is saying. There is a being called God that exists with three persons of one essence, the same God that saved the people of Israel, that created all things, this God exists in a multiplicity of persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And that center person, God the Son, John titles the Word, God's self-expression. And he was not created with all other things. He was eternal. He was in the beginning before time began. He was... What John is stating, and he will make very clear, the word is a reference to Jesus Christ. What we need to understand is that for John and for anyone that had been around Jesus, what was most blatantly obvious was that Jesus was a man. That was blatantly obvious. You didn't have to demonstrate or prove that. It was obvious that Jesus was a man. He walked like a man. He spoke like a man. He ate. He slept. He wept. He was cold. He was hot. He had to have shelter. He breathed in the dust of the, the streets. He coughed. He grew tired. He grew weary. He was a man. You didn't have to do any demonstration. No proving was necessary to, to demonstrate to John, the man who wrote this book, that this was a man. That there was a man named Jesus. It was, it was obvious. As obvious as the person sitting next to you. If you turn to the person next to you, what is obvious about them? They are a human. No jokes between brothers and sisters, okay? They, they, they are a human, okay? It is obvious they are a human being. They look like a human being. They talk like a human being. They walk like a human being. They get tired like a human being. They eat and drink like human beings. And that was blatantly obvious about Jesus. It was obvious that he was a man. So when John says about Jesus, the man he is introducing in this biographical sketch called the Gospel of John, what is the most obvious thing to everyone is that he was a man. He is clearly, undeniably human. And John says he was with God in the beginning and he is God. This man was with God and is God. It's one thing to talk about God in a kind of general sort of philosophical sense. He's out there somewhere. What John is doing, he's not just talking about God in a general philosophical sense. He's talking about the man that he knows, Jesus Christ, that was evidently human, physical, fleshly, and he's saying this man is God. He was God before he was man. In becoming man, he remained God. He was God and is God the Son. He is God. He is divine. This man, so obviously human, no, no different than any other human that you've ever seen. There, there was no way to tell that Jesus was more than a man by looking at him. But John says he was not less than a man, but he was more. He was God. He was God the Son. And actually, this is the testimony of the rest of the New Testament as well. That Jesus Christ, the man in Galilee, the man born of a woman, 
who grew as an infant, who experienced the helplessness of childhood, who had to learn his letters and read his Bible, that boy, that young man, that man was God himself. John's good friend Peter writes this, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our, listen, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. God. God the eternal God. God the all-powerful God. God the authoritative God. God the infinite God. God. That God. No less than God the Father. God, the one that Peter had walked with and spoken with and dared to rebuke, is the one he sang is the God and Savior of those who believe in him. Remarkable. Paul, uh, Paul writes in Titus that we are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our, listen, great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possessions who are jealous for good works. And then there's a host of scriptures that make it clear that Jesus shares the divinity of God and is to be worshipped as God. For example, you have Jesus' half-brother, the son of Mary and Joseph, Jude, who writes in Jude 5, now I want to remind you, listen to this, and imagine, this is a Jewish man saying this, the man who knew Jesus as as a boy who saw him eat and drink, who, who saw him walk and, and serve perhaps with his father in the carpentry shop, who, who knew that he was a human boy. This is that brother. Listen to what he says. I want you to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, I think he uses his human name on purpose, Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. That's his human half-brother saying that, the son of Mary. And Joseph. He's saying, Jesus, what did he do? He saved those who did not believe. Jesus himself says in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. And then we have the wonderful culminating verses in Revelation 22 written by this same man, the Apostle John. No longer will there be anything accursed, but listen, the throne of God and of the Lamb. Singular throne with God and the Lamb. They will be in it and his servants will do what? They will worship him. They will worship him as God and man. The God-man, Jesus Christ. Sometimes, because it's easier for us, we can think about Jesus exclusively in terms of his manhood without reference to his deity or his deity without reference to his manhood. But the glory of Jesus Christ requires us to always see one in terms of the other. We won't see the glory of his humanity unless we are holding on to the reality of his deity. We will not see the glory of his humanity unless we're holding on to his deity or his deity unless we are aware of his humanity. That's what I'm saying. All of these references to deity are written by those who knew without any doubt that Jesus was a man. He didn't cease being God when he became a man. He continued as God the Son. And they are saying, those who knew he was a man, that this man was the eternal, infinite, unchanging, unlimited, powerful, absolutely authoritative God. This is the point, the significant point of the Council of Chalcedon. That's what they were seeking to, to guard against was denials and heresies of this biblical truth. Because it is hard to understand. It is so glorious that human beings would rather reduce it than stand in awe of it. And so a lot of these church fathers came together in Chalcedon to write that very impressive creed that walks through. And each of those words is very significant. They were defending against some heretical idea that would seek to minimize the glory of this. Well, perhaps Jesus just appeared to be a man. Perhaps he was temporarily not God. Perhaps he just looked like a man. Perhaps there was a time when he wasn't God and then he became God after being a man. All of those heresies were attempts to reduce the glory to eclipse the glory of what God did that we celebrate at Christmas. And Chalcedon, these brave and courageous church fathers and pastors stood up and said, no, no, the glory, as bright as it is, as hard as it is to look at, as far as it is beyond our understanding, must be preserved. This is the God-man. 
Neither less than either, nor more or different than both. He is the God-man, Jesus Christ. I won't reread the creed, but Matt Pearman has, has helpfully summarized five key points that Chalcedon preserves for us that are referenced in John uh, chapter 1 and other scriptures. First of all, Jesus has two natures. He is God and man. He has a human nature, body, heart, will. He has a divine nature. Each nature is full and complete. He is fully God and fully man. He is not partially God and partially man. He was never partially God and partially man. Each nature remains distinct. So his godness doesn't make him uh, more human. He is as human as you and I are. His human nature didn't make him less like God. He was always just as God as he ever was. Christ is only one person. So there aren't two persons that merge together. A divine person that indwells a human body. One of the heresies that was rejected. Or perhaps a divine person and a human person that sort of walk through existence forever together. No, there is one person who exists simultaneously with two natures. One human and one divine that he always experiences at the same time forever. Things, fifth point that Perriman points out about Chalcedon, things that are true of only one nature are nonetheless true of the person of Christ. Thus Paul can write that God's own blood was shed on the cross. Though God has no blood, in the human nature of God the Son, it can be stated that God's own blood was shed on the cross. Listen, we will not see the glory of the Son of God unless we think deeply and biblically about these truths. When John says, the Word was with God and the Word was God, and then in verse 14, he brings to this marvelous culmination, the Word that was with God, that was God, became flesh. He writes verse 14, if you look down in your chapter, very specifically, very intentionally. One commentator says almost shockingly to make the point. He didn't just appear to be flesh. He didn't just indwell a body. He didn't just inhabit a human form. No, he became, he took on flesh, a human nature. He added to himself that which could only conceal the ultimate glory that he continued to possess as God the Son. So that who was walking around those streets in Galilee? It was God. Who was it that was dying on the cross? It was God. Now God in his divine nature cannot die. So he had to add to himself a human nature that could experience pain and death. God in his divine nature cannot be tempted. So he had to add a human nature that can be tempted and can endure every temptation in our place. God in his divine nature cannot live under the authority of his own law. So he added a human nature that could exist under the authority of the law in our place. God in his divine nature cannot be cursed because he's never done anything wrong. So he added a human nature that could be attributed our sin so that it could be cursed and he could take our place on that tree. This is the glory of God the Son. God was God the Son continued to be God the Son even as he endured the blasphemy of those mocking and deriding him. He continued to be God the Son even as he was hanging on the cross crying out to his Father. His human nature was experiencing everything that a human would experience on that cross without any mitigation or diminish, the diminishment by his divine nature. His divine nature didn't make it easier for him to be human. It didn't make him less human. It didn't overcome temptations for him. He experienced it just as fully as you would, and more so because he did it to the end. One way we sort of eclipse this glory in our mind is we, we sort of act as though God the Son turned the lights off for a while. He sort of just went to sleep, existed as a human, and the Father and the Spirit kind of did extra work in maintaining the galaxies and the stars and everything, 
But what the church fathers rightly pointed out is that that's impossible. God the Son cannot cease being and doing all that he does. So here's the the majestic glory of when John says the word was with God, the word was God. All that God is was true of God the Son and continued to be true even as he was enduring in his human nature everything that mankind could do against him. If we just take advantage of, of what John says about him in his deity in the next few verses, I think we can, we can see some of the glory of this. First of all, his power. His power. John wants to make it very clear that this man, Christ Jesus, was the person of God the Son, and he makes it clear that his power is divine. Notice, notice in verse 3, he says, All things were made through him, and lest we think that this is an exception, without him was not anything made that was made. There's only one thing that was not made, and that's God. And Jesus was God's agent of creation. So here, here's the glory of this. Everything that was made, God the Son made as God's agent of creation. Here's why that's, here's why that's incredible. This is the power of God the Son. This, this is the, the incredible power of it. In his divine power, he created a human body. Think about this. Think about this. That was vulnerable to pain and weakness and death. He created nerves that could be severed, blood that could be spilled, skin that could be split, a brain that could register pain, and a body that could experience dehydration and the horror of drowning in bodily fluid on the cross. He created all of that. He created the cellular structure that grows very slowly such that a baby is absolutely dependent on human parents for survival. He created that. He created that body. He created it knowing that he would experience all of its realities without any mitigation because of his deity. He created that. God the Son. Not only does his power create all things, Colossians 1, 15 through 17 makes it clear that he sustains their ongoing existence at a molecular level and continues, continues to do so during his incarnation. Do you see how we can sort of eclipse this, try to make it easier? Well, I don't know. I mean, God the Son just kind of went to sleep for a while in heaven, or maybe he just stopped being God temporarily. We try to minimize the glory of this. And the church fathers rightly hold, hold to the biblical teaching. No, it, it is more glorious than that. Don't let the eclipse of some, some human, easier-to-understand explanation banish his glory from your mind. Colossians 1.15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and listen to this, in him all things hold together. In him all things hold Hold together. He sustains the ongoing existence of his creation. So that means he sustained the neurons of those angry at him. He sustained the tendons of those lashing him, the vocal cords of those mocking him, the heartbeats of those crucifying him. God the Son did not cease to be God for even a moment through every experience of human weakness on earth. This was the point of the temptation. Uh, Satan, when he came to him in the wilderness, was saying, you're, you're, you're the son, so turn these stones into bread. You're experiencing hunger. Now, as God the son, could he instantly eliminate that experience of hunger? Yes, he could. But in his human nature, he was going to experience every temptation as we do and yet without sin. And so in his deity, according to his divine obedience to his father, he would not mitigate the human experience of hunger or of death. 
He did not use his divinity to minimize the humiliation or weakness of his human nature in any way, though his power was capable at any moment of removing every human limitation for his human nature. He chose to continue to experience his human pain and weakness without fail until that nature expired in death. We must not let our sight of his glory be eclipsed. But what does this mean? That God the Son, who is the God-man, is all-powerful. Well, it certainly means that we can bring our weaknesses to him now. The man who knows our weakness personally, personally because he endured it to the very end, is the same one who has power to sustain any human being in every moment. When we pray to Jesus, we are praying simultaneously to the one who understands every weakness to the end and has all power to sustain his people. That is his glory. He understands fully every weakness and he has complete power to sustain every weak person. That is God the Son incarnate come to save us. Let's think about his sufficiency. Notice this. John moves from his, his, his creating power to his self-sustaining life. In him, he says in verse 4, was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, now because we live in a relatively healthy country, we, we can forget how incredible this quality is of self-existence. That there is no being in the universe that exists because of their own power except for God. God needs no external life support. He is his own life support. Unlike any other being, you eat and sleep and drink. I eat and sleep and drink, and that's the same as every other person. You cannot make the food grow that you need to eat. That's why people die of hunger. You cannot create the water that you need to drink. That's why people die of thirst. You cannot maintain the organs that you need to live. That's why people die of a thousand diseases. But God, God has no such vulnerability. He has life in himself. And this life is present in God the Son. And as John will make clear, it's not just the physical life that he has, it's the spiritual life. It's the life of joy. That's why he calls it the light. It's the light of men. John's view of life is not just the physical beating of a heart. It's the real vibrancy of life in God. And who has that life? God the Son. In him was Life And John will make very clear, this is the life he offers to dying sinners. Those dying physically, those dying spiritually, those decaying in a love affair with this world, those loving empty cisterns that can hold no water, those clinging to idols of hatred and fear and bitterness. Th those, those people, he offers life to them because he has it in himself. And remember, if we want to see the glory, we have to see this divine quality in the context of the fact that John is talking about his friend, Jesus Christ, the man. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The glory of this life is present, listen to this, in the person who surrendered himself to the curse of death. The one who has life in himself experienced death. Being invulnerable to death, he gave himself to death in his human nature and conquered the curse of death in his perfect sacrifice. This is why it was necessary for him to be the God-man. Because not only did he satisfy the curse of death, death in the end had no power over the one in whom is life. God the Son. Such that God the Son could be resurrected in his human nature. Because he had conquered the curse of death in our place, and in him was life. And he offers that life to every Christian who believes in him. How did the divinity of God the Son reveal the power of his life? How did he do it? By wiping out every rebellious rebel and proving by his continued existence that in him alone was life? No. 
He re- revealed that not only in giving physical life to all of his creatures, but in giving spiritual life through the experience of his own death to all those who would believe in him. Because he had life in himself, rather than through the cursed line of Adam's race, he was able to give his life freely to others so that they also could escape the curse of death. All of our life, both past and future, is found in him. If Jesus was only a man, there would only be hope for a better life before death. But because he is God... There is hope for eternal life, welling up in the soul of those united to him, and victory of over death because death can lay no permanent claim on him and on those who find their life in him. What does that mean? It means we must find our life in God the Son incarnate. Because he's incarnate, he takes our death. Because he's God the Son, he has life in himself, and we can find our life in him. The divine sufficiency of the Son means that any life that is truly life is only available in Him. And anything else that claims to be a life is only a poor reflection or a cheap knockoff. To see Jesus as God the Son is to reject everything and any other source of real life and find it exclusively in Him. So we don't find life in our reputation, in our idols, in our comfort in this world. We find life in Him because in Him is life and the life is the light of men. Here is his glory. Having become man and knowing the temptations of every man and every woman, he offers himself as a fountain of life, endless life, eternal life, unbreakable life to every heart that will receive him. His power is divine. His sufficiency is is divine and his supremacy. Third divine quality that John draws out, notice there in verse 5, his supremacy, the light that he has, it shines in the darkness. And notice this summarizing phrase as he concludes his intro. The darkness has not overcome it. The darkness has not overcome overcome it. He is called the light. John weaves together all these metaphors. He's the word, God's self-expression. He is the life because it contains the life of God within him for all who come to him. He is the light, which he is a beacon of hope in a world of darkness clinging to idols. And he is that light in such a way that the darkness of evil and sin cannot overcome it. What is the glory of God the Son? Because he conquers the darkness that rejected him and instead gives hope to all those who believe in him. A hope that that cannot be conquered because he is God. He's not just a hero. He's not just a human hero charging the gates, more brave than the average man. He's not just a human hero who can improve your life by following his example. He's not just a human hero who can rescue you from some hopelessness or some sense of pointlessness. He is a divine son who can permanently conquer the darkness that is present in your life and in my life and in this creation. If he was only man, he would be worthy of emulation, but not worthy of obedience and surrender. But because he is the divine son incarnate to save us his victory is absolutely guaranteed and in his incarnate salvation we have hope of participating in it he is the beacon of hope the darkness does not overcome the light so the light of hope that he provides because he is god is a light that cannot be conquered As a man, Jesus could provide a sort of temporary light, as all sorts of poets and heroes did before him and after him. And even other religions will acknowledge that Jesus provided a kind of human light. But, because he is God the Son, he could provide a light that cannot be conquered, a light that is extraordinary, supernatural, And he demonstrated the invincible light of his Godhead. Listen, how did he demonstrate it? How did he demonstrate that he could conquer darkness? By eradicating all darkness, including that in your heart and in mine? No. But rather, by allowing his manhood to be submerged under the darkness of death. In his human nature, the light of the world allowed himself to be extinguished. 
on the cross so that the light of his salvation could extend unhindered to the end of this world. The darkness would not be able to overcome it. His light would reign supreme over every darkness because it conquered the very right of darkness over any human being who believes in him. The darkness of guilt and death and shame and fear and sin and hopelessness cannot overcome the light of God the Son. He is God the Son, offering his light of life in supreme victory over all sin and death to all those who would believe in him and freshly to those who have been doubting that there is someone out there who can overcome the darkness of this evil world and the darkness of your heart. Part of what it means to be a Christian is to believe that because our Savior is God the Son, He is supreme over every darkness that we face. The glory of God is a unique kind of glory. John Piper calls it a peculiar glory because it reveals itself most startlingly in offering itself in humility to save those who are unworthy of it. His strength is revealed in the weakness of giving up his strength in order to save the helpless. His light is revealed in being extinguished so that it can save those in darkness. And since God the Son could never be extinguished, since he is God, he added to himself a nature that has the potential to do all of those things in order to rescue us. The same power, sufficiency, and supremacy resides in him still. But not only as the divine Son, but as the divine Son become man. As the God-man, he maintains all the power of God displayed toward those he purchased with his human blood. As the God-man, he exercises all the knowledge of God focused on those he redeemed through his human weakness. As the God-man, he exercises his authority as God in the building of his church so that men and women claimed by him to be his brothers and sisters can stand forever in the family of God. As the God-man, he receives all the glory as the supreme victor of God, and he will receive glory in endless worship as those who were purchased by him raise their voices to proclaim him. And he will reign in glory and power and exaltation forever. King of kings, Lord of lords, the lion and the lamb, fully God and fully man forever. The man Christ Jesus glorified to save us. The God, the son incarnate to rescue us. Mabel Tumas, the lady that wrote that book about the eclipse, describes the conclusion of it this way. Suddenly, instantaneously, as a lightning flash, an arrow of actual sunlight strikes the landscape, and earth comes to life again. All the corona and the prominences melt into the returning brilliance. And occasionally the receding lunar shadow is glimpsed as it flies away. That is our experience when we look at this word to study the word. God, the Son, incarnate to save us. And that will be the experience of every human being when this Son returns in all of his divine glory, the one person of God the Son, God and man, perfectly able to rescue those who are united to him in his humanity and perfectly able to bring them into heaven because he is also God the Son. Brothers and sisters, let's allow the word this Christmas season to peel back the familiar and let the glory of God the Son shine in our faces again. I'd like to encourage you a couple of very practical recommendations as we close. Because my hope is not just that a single message would impact us, but that this season would impact our souls. 
Uh, we have a book, a few copies anyway, in the bookstore called The First Days of Jesus, written by a man named Andreas Kostenberger. It just talks about the incarnation, looking through the Gospels. It will be well worth your time to read. I also would encourage you to take a look at the opening sections of each of the Gospels. Study what they write about Jesus in this holiday season. And let your heart be warmed thinking about this miracle that he came to save us. I would encourage you to do that. Make, make that maybe a devotional focus as you take your time in your, in your Bible reading. Let's use this season to have our hearts illuminated by his glory for us and for our families. Let's allow his glory to shine on our hearts with its full brilliance and the power of the Spirit. Let's pray.